Uh, so if you're new this morning, let me tell you about where we're at. We are in a series we've uh, called Jesus Stories. Jesus Stories. And we're looking at uh, the different miracles of Jesus that are found in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 11 this morning. Luke chapter 11 this morning. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, get your Bibles out. How many of you have the Word of God in your hand this morning? Come on, Jesus. Yes. His word, the word of God is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And we just believe, man, I want you to follow along with me to read the words of the Lord for yourself. We're going to be verses 14 through 20. Next week, uh, it's going to be part two of this message, and we'll be in verses 21 through 28. But I've entitled my message today, uh, The Finger of God Part One. We'll be in part two next week. And uh, also want to make you aware, if you would like my notes, you can text uh, notes to uh, the number that hopefully is going to come up on the screen. I'm not sure if they have that or not. Or you can visit the Journey Church app and get my message notes and download them. Let's dive in and let's read Luke chapter 11 together. How many are ready this morning? Come on, how many are ready for God's word today? I really feel like this is a timely word. I feel like this is going to be a word that has the opportunity to really uh, mark you and mark our lives. Uh, the, really, the Lord really dealt with me uh, on this personally. So it's not just for you, it is also for me today. Let's read this together, Luke chapter 11, verse 14. And he, he is talking about Jesus, was casting out of a out a demon, and it was mute. In other words, there was a person who had a demonic spirit, and it was manifesting itself in this man by causing him not to speak. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebub. Beelzebub is another name for Satan. Through so saying about Jesus, he cast out demons by Satan, the ruler of demons. Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. Verse 17, but he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, so this is Jesus speaking now right here, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say I cast out demons by Beelzebub. So right there, Jesus is proving them with logic. He's saying to them, there's no way that I cast out demons by Satan. And he goes on, he says this. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? He says to them, you claim that I cast out demons by the power of Satan, that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Then he turns to the religious leaders of the time and he says to them, well, by whom do your sons cast them out? Or in other words, by whom do your followers cast them out? By who do your disciples cast them out? And his point is, they don't cast them out at all. Here's the key now, verse 20. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, say the finger of God, this is Jesus speaking, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, would you breathe upon our text today? Would you breathe upon your word? Lord, would you breathe upon your logos word? your written word, and make it rhema to us, God. Make it alive, O oh Jesus. Lord, I pray that, God, you would rid me right now, God, of any man-pleasing, God. That, Lord, my one measure, Father, would be just to please you and you alone, Jesus. Lord, we are here for one reason, that is to hear from you. 
God, I pray that, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see exactly, God, what you have for us. Because, Lord, I believe that in this room today, God, that you're going to do a work inside of our hearts. God, may you write the law inside of our hearts, God. For, Lord, we need to be people, God, who walk in holiness, God. And it's not by our own might, not by our own power, but it's by your spirit, God. It's when you come and you fill us up with your spirit, Jesus. So, Lord, I pray today, God, that you would fill your people up, God, with your spirit. Lord, I can't do it, God. But Lord, may you do it, Jesus. We release all control. We relinquish every control, all control to you. We love you, Jesus. And we're desperate for you, God. Make us more into your image, oh God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. Let me silence my watch real quick. All right, there we go. I was getting dings. How many of you know that uh, things sometimes they get, they get lost in translation? That sometimes some things are said by one person and then it goes to another person and then it goes to another person and it gets lost in translation. This, uh, this past week, if you haven't noticed, we were, we were not here last week. We were on vacation. Uh, we were visiting my parents up in North Carolina. And one of the things that we did just me and the kids and, and my wife and our families, we went whitewater rafting. Now, one thing that I like to do when I'm, whenever I'm doing something is I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And so the guide would always give us instructions while we're whitewater rafting. So we're on class two, class three rapids. It's not class four, class five. I mean, class five rapids, it's intense, y'all. But this is my first time that going out with my kids I've been on class four before. It's insane. Like you got to make sure you're, you're, uh, when you're going down waterfalls or you're in intense rapids, that you're doing it right. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't want to flip over the boat. I don't want to get cold. Like that mountain water is cold, and so I want to stay. And it was overcast when we went, so I don't want. I want to make sure everybody's on the same page and we're going the right direction. And so the guide would give us uh, directions as we were going down the river. And for me, you know, like I don't hear well, and it really kind of comes from uh, being a musician for many years and having, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, they have ears in, the, uh, in, in, their, in their ears, they have this uh, inner monitors or hearing in here, and so I always like to crank it up, so I've got a little bad hearing in my right ear, to be honest with you. If you ever, if you ever see me ask you for a question, like, hey, can you repeat that again? It might happen three times because my hearing's bad. And so, but we're going down whitewater raft, we're going down these rapids, and the guide is telling us instruction, but I want to make sure also my kids are hearing what the guide is saying. He's a little bit soft-spoken. And so he would say things like, hey, two forward and then four back as we're going down the rapids. And so I would relay the message and kind of shout it out to my family in the boat. All right, guys, here we go. Two forward, four back, you know. But there's a couple of moments, maybe one or two moments where he would give a command and I'm kind of getting confused with what he was saying and things got kind of lost in translation. The Bible is written in Greek in the New Testament. But Jesus, when he was speaking here, he was talking in Hebrew. So obviously we're reading in English, and so it's coming from Hebrew to Greek back to English, right? And sometimes we lose some of the punch of the scriptures and what it means. That's why it's important to go back and look at the original language so you can kind of see what the meaning really is. And we encounter what's known as a Hebrew idiomatic phrase here in the text in verse 20. There's a couple of other Hebrew idiomatic phrases that you might be familiar with. One's like um, flowing with milk and honey, meaning uh, fertile ground, or one like uh, uh, eye of a needle, which means it's difficult to pass through. These are Hebrew idiomatic phrases. And in verse 20, we see another Hebrew idiomatic phrase that kind of loses its punch with the finger of God. And so Jesus is saying, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, when you're going back, you look at the original text of why the same finger of God, you can trace it all the way back to Exodus is when we first see it. And in Exodus, the finger of God is what wrote the law of God. The finger of God directly translated, translated means Holy Spirit. 
So what Jesus was actually saying is this. If I cast out demons by the spirit of holiness that wrote the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the second phrase here, the kingdom of God has come upon you, when you look at it, it almost looks like a positive thing. It almost looks like a, uh, this, is, this is a positive thing, this is good, the kingdom of God coming upon you, and we kind of look at it, we're saying, okay, the kingdom of God is for me, the kingdom of God is with me. But when I was reading about this in one of my commentaries, they gave the example of this, that it's as if a criminal is in a bush, and then all of a sudden the police come and they capture the criminal. And so when you break this text down in verse 20, it's meaning this. Jesus is saying, if I cast out demons by the spirit of holiness that wrote the law on Mount Sinai, or where we see it in Daniel chapter 5, where the finger of God writes the law in Belteshar's palace, or in Exodus chapter 8, where the reason why the magicians couldn't turn the dust to lice was because they said the finger of God. So if I cast out demons by the spirit of holiness that wrote the law on Mount Sinai, then surely the kingdom of God has captured your heart. It's powerful when you really understand what it really means. How many of you want to be captured by the heart of God? You want to be arrested by the heart of God, by the kingdom of God? My iPad just went blank. Help me, Jesus. Where am I at? Here we go. So if I have done this by the finger of God, then surely the kingdom of God has arrested and captured my heart. So let me say it like this now. If this is the finger of God, then you've just been captured by the Holy Spirit. Now here we are. Here's where we were. So this presents an issue though, okay? So looking at the text here, this presents an issue. It's this. If we mistakenly look at the holiness of God, the spirit of holiness in a legalistic way, then it binds us and we can see God as this cosmic cop in the heavens looking to smite us, looking to take us out, right? So I don't know about you, but I grew up in a, in a church that led me to believe it led me to believe that if I did one thing wrong, then there would be a chance that depending on how bad it was, that I would miss the rapture <laughs> and go to hell. That's not good theology at all. And so I remember a couple of times coming home uh, and I would expect to see my parents at the house and they, they weren't there. And this is before cell phones, y'all. So I'm thinking to myself as a... 14, 15, 16, 17 year old, oh my goodness, like did I get left behind? <laughs> did I miss the rapture? You know what I'm saying? Like that kind of thought came to my mind. My church had like heaven's gates, hell's flames, and so I had the fear of the Lord within me and I was thinking, man, did I lose my salvation? And I was thinking about what did I do wrong? Like did I, did, what was, oh, I thought this bad thought. Am I, am I, am I, did I miss the rapture? My parents aren't here. Like those kinds of thoughts came over my head and came to my head. Like, I was looked at God in a bad way and looked at him as this cosmic cop looking to take me out if I did anything wrong. So we get this fearful feeling that the Holy Spirit or the finger of God that wrote the law stands against us and that he's just waiting for us to do something wrong. So here's the dilemma that we face in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus sets this demon-possessed person free by what? By the finger of God, the same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments. So if the finger of God writes the law, follow me here, if the finger of God writes the law in the Old Testament, but then comes and sets this man free, then is the house of God as divided as he says is the house of Satan. 
Can God bind us up with the law and then set us free by the same power that writes the law? What I'm getting at is how we view the holiness of God is so vitally important. How we view the holiness of God is so vitally vitally important. I want to give you a definition for holiness this morning. Holiness is this, is to be set apart. Simply to be set apart. You might be saying, okay, what is God set apart from? God is set apart from sin. He's set apart completely from sin. So this is what I want to do. As we're looking at this text, I want to give you three things this morning. Three things on the holiness of God. Because again, our view of the holiness of God is so vitally important. Number one, number one, because God is holy, his spirit sets us free. Because God is holy, his spirit sets us free. So in a conversation between Moses and God, God says to Moses, to tell the people of Israel in Leviticus chapter 19 too. He says, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, am I the only one in this room, but when I read that and I think, okay, God's telling me to be holy for he is holy. Now, am I the only one in the room that's thinking to myself, okay, God, sure, it's easy for you because you're up in heaven. You're not around all these people that make you mad and make you upset. It's easy for you to say that you're God, you can be holy. Why are you asking me to do something that's impossible? And then we view the scripture of God saying, okay, you're going to be holy for I am holy. And we look at it and say, God's saying to us, you're going to be holy. Or you're going to be holy. That's how we read it. But this is what really, let me give you an example of it. If we were to pretend for a moment that I was a, uh, a professor uh, teaching Harvard Law. I'm not nearly smart enough to do that, y'all, by no means. And you were my students. And you came in the first day of class, and I said to you on the first day of class, I said, you're going to make an A. I don't care what you do, you're going to make an A. And I got really angry about it. Immediately, if I was you, I would immediately go, and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to find another class, find another professor, because that professor's whack. (laughs) But if you came into class and I said to you, listen, I humbly want to tell you, I'm the, uh, what you've heard about me, what you've read about me is accurate. I'm the greatest professor, and I mean that in the most humble way. And because of my knowledge of the law, I'm telling you, you're going to make an A. You're going to ace this class. You're going to make it. It's okay, I'm going to teach you the law, and I'm going to write the law in your heart, and you're going to understand it, and I'm telling you, you're going to make an A. You see, what God is saying to us is, listen, I'm holy, and you're my son and my my daughter. And he's saying, because I am holy, I'm going to write the law of God on your heart, and you're going to be holy. You're going to be holy because I am holy. He's not lording the law over you. He's not an angry God. He's looking at you and says, I want to write the law on your heart. And as I write the law in your heart, you're going to be able to do it because I'm the greatest teacher. Reminds me of Romans. I love the book of Romans. You ever doubt the love of God and his grace? Go read the book of Romans. Romans 1, 1 through 5 says this, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God. Here's the key. With power according to the spirit of holiness or the Holy Spirit. With power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, through him we have received grace and by apostleship, for obedience to the faith. 
Please do not hear this as saying that God doesn't care how we live because he says you will be holy as I am holy. God gives us grace to obey. Listen, mercy, mercy is forgiveness when we did not deserve it. God has given you mercy when you did not deserve it. None of us have arrived. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And it is God's mercy that he forgave us. But God's grace, his grace is this. His grace is that he gave us the Holy Spirit and placed the law in our hearts. And now we can overcome sin and turn completely to him. He gives us desire for him. You see what grace is? Grace is him placing the Holy Spirit within us so we only have one desire, and that is Jesus. Then this is a process. And remember, it's not Zechariah 4. It's not by might. It's not by power, but what is it by? It's by his Spirit, says the Lord. How do we walk in holiness? It's only through the Holy Spirit. It's not through trying hard or having the will to do it, it's only by the Holy Spirit. In other words, he says, I am holy, you shall be holy, you will have the law, but the law will not hang over you. You see, we don't live our whole lives terrified that we must obey the law or else we will be crushed by God because no one can do that. It's incredibly dangerous, though, to live our lives overextending grace at the same time. That we can sin, we can do anything we want, But God's grace will cover us. God's mercy will cover us. But it's equally dangerous to get into a legalistic mindset of trying to obey the law, trying to walk in obedience out of our own ability and who we are, because none of us can do it. It's only through the power of the Holy Spirit. So what then is the answer? It is this. He says, I, the Holy Spirit, and the finger of God, and the finger of God always does the same thing. What does it do? He writes the law, but the law within you becomes the law of freedom and liberty. He writes it on our hearts, and that brings us freedom. The law is not there to bind you. It's to give you freedom as he writes it in your heart. And so it becomes the law then of transformation, church. So number two this morning. Number one, because God is holy, he sets us free. Number two, because God is holy, his spirit transforms us. Because God is holy, his spirit transforms us. Second Corinthians 3, 17 through 18 says this. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You see, His Spirit transforms us to be like Christ. His Spirit is at work within us continually to transform us to be like Christ. That's why Paul writes, renew your mind daily. You see, the process of sanctification is not a one-time thing. It is a process. It is transformation. And God is transforming us to be more like him. And this will be a journey that we will be always be on until we're with him in heaven. Now, this reminds me a little bit of Exodus chapter 4. In Exodus chapter 4, Moses gets the call to go and to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And in that moment, Moses is thinking, he's 80 years old, and he's thinking to himself, man, Lord, what are you going to do to help me because this is way too big for me? And he gets this encouragement from God. He says, okay, I see this staff that's in your hand. I want you to take this staff. I want you to throw it down the ground. And so Moses is obedient. He takes a staff. He throws it down the ground. And y'all, it turns to a snake. If I was Moses, I would immediately run the other way. Like, okay, God, why are you turning something to a snake? I'm scared of snakes. I don't know about you. And then he tells Moses this. He says to him, okay, Moses, I want you to pick up the snake by its tail. Now, we all know this, that you don't pick up a snake. You definitely don't pick up a snake by its tail because it's going to come back and bite you, right? So Moses is obedient. He picks up the snake by its tail, and immediately it turns to his staff again. 
Then he asks him to do another thing. He says, I want you to put your hand into your bosom, into your shirt. And so Moses places it near his heart, puts it into his clothes. Then God says to him, okay, take your hand out. His hand's full of leprosy. And he says to him again, hey, put it back in. He puts it back in to his shirt, takes it back out, and it's clean. I don't know everything that God was speaking to Moses in that moment, but what I do know is this, and I believe that God was telling Moses that whatever is in your heart, in the extremities, in the deepness of your heart, is going to make it out into the extremities of your life. That your heart is going to be revealed. And so he's telling him in that moment, allow me to work on your heart. You see, God is constantly transforming us and making us into his image and working on our heart. I don't know about you, but I need some heart work. I need continual heart work. But what that takes is for the Holy Spirit to continually come in to fill me up, just as Paul wrote, and I said earlier, is to to renew your mind daily by the Holy Spirit. And so as we renew our mind daily, as we get into the Word, as we pray, as we spend time with Him, He renews our hearts and He makes us more like Him. And so that, man, we we can be like Him and be reflections to Him of this world. So what does he do? By the power of the Holy Spirit, he transforms us. He transforms us. So God says, I don't want to be this cosmic referee, church. I don't want to be screaming at you. I'm not angry at you. What I want to do is to change you from the inside out. He wants to reach down into our heart and change us from the inside out. Would you open your heart to him and allow him to do the deep work that only the Holy Spirit can do? Because God is holy, his spirit transforms us. Here's my third point this morning. Because God is holy, we can be confident in his promises. Because God is holy, his holiness allows us to know that we can be confident in his promises. Amos 4.2 says this, the sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness. Psalm 89, 35, once I have promised by my holy name, I will not lie. You see, because God is holy, we can be confident in his promises to us as his people. We talk about the holiness of God and some of us think, okay, that makes me a little apprehensive. But it's to make us know that God is dependable, that God is approachable. God is approachable, y'all. He may be a holy God, but man, he is approachable. What if today, think about it like this. What if today someone walked into the church and said, I want to give my life to Jesus. I've never given my life to Jesus. I believe there's someone in this room today who needs to make that decision. I want to give my life to Jesus. And how I responded was, okay, let me go make sure that God's in a good mood right now. So, hey, you stay here. I'm going to go up into the Holy of Holies. I'm going to check on it. And if he's in a bad mood, I'm going to wave you off because he might kill you. But if he's in a good mood, I'm going to wave you on up because he's going to save you. That's not the case, is it? God is constant. He is constant. And his word is true. And so if he says to you, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and then what? Believe in your heart you will be saved. What allows us to be confident in this? His holiness. And so we can be confident also that as we draw near to God, he's going to draw near to us. That we are people as we come before him and we really fully surrender before him that God is going to meet us right there, church. We can be confident that the Holy Spirit is with us, that when we surrendered our life to him, the Holy Spirit came and he began to do this transforming work of sanctifying grace. We can be confident in that. We can be confident because he is holy. The holiness of God is what reinforces every promise of God. Look, I believe wholeheartedly in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe wholeheartedly in the baptism 
of the Spirit, that he has good gifts for us and we're to earnestly seek them out. But listen to me, I believe even more the baptism of the Holy Spirit is more for sanctifying grace than anything else. It's for sanctifying grace. It's to transform us from the inside out. Because what? It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit of God. And so as the Spirit of God comes in, in, into our life and forms us into his image, that is what it's there for. It's not for us to get a Holy Ghost goosebump, y'all. It's not for us to get this feeling all over ourselves and to be emotional. I believe God's created us with emotion. It's good to, ex to experience that and to ex express our emotion. But if that is only for us to feel good about ourselves, Lord, please help us. I heard someone say uh, this past week, and I, I agreed with him, I don't want my church to be a charismatic zoo. <laughs> And I was like, that's a great way of saying it. We don't want to be this charismatic zoo that only comes together and gets this emotional experience. We want the Holy Spirit to come and his glory to show up. And what his glory does is it transforms us into his image. It's not there to make us feel good and to have this overly hype emotional experience. Lord, help us when we've made it that way. You know what? I have to admit, at times I've made it that way. Lord, forgive me. For those moments and those times, may we desire the Holy Spirit for one thing, and that is for us to be filled up with this transforming grace that allows us to go out and to actually be reflections of him. If we experience the power of the Holy Spirit in this place, but then we don't go out to the highways and byways and tell the people that don't know Jesus about the one that we love, then we are missing it, church. We are missing it. We're not here for emotional feeling or for us to be a charismatic over the top church or for us to experience a Holy Ghost goosebump. That is not why we are here. We are here to make a difference for the kingdom of God. And I believe wholeheartedly the best way to make a difference for the kingdom of God is not out of willpower, not out of us trying to make it happen, trying to be good people, but it's for us to experience the glory of God. You see, true revival happens True, well, no true revival is happening when we go out, we make a difference in this world. In church, we are by and large making a huge difference, but I'm telling you, I believe that there is more. As we steward his presence and steward him and the Holy Spirit in our lives, man, church, like, as we steward that, he's going to pour out his spirit even more, but he's looking for people that want to be holy that want to be set apart and be holy as he is holy in him alone. That's what he's looking for, people. Help us, Lord. It is not by your own will that you're going to be holy. It's not by coming in here and living like the world and then uh, worshiping him and trying to fabricate some kind of feeling. That's not how it's going to happen. It's going to be allowing the Spirit of God to come in and the finger of God to write the law on your heart. And as he writes the law on our hearts, and he gives us this overwhelming desire to be like him. Help us, God, to be like him. To be like him. To know him, like really know him. Not just out of, not just out of our Relig religiosity, a lot of religion or playing church. Forget all that. It's garbage. It's garbage. May we live completely set apart as the Holy Spirit transforms us. I can't do it myself. I'm not that good. It's only the Spirit of God that can do it. So my invitation to you today is you would allow the finger of God as Jesus set that man free 
by the finger of God that wrote the law on Mount Sinai and gave it to Moses. It also sets you free. So no longer are you bound by the law, but you were free in Christ. And you would walk in freedom. Some of you, you have been, you've been thinking to yourself, I want to be free. You've been asking the presence of God, Lord, Lord, I'm still struggling with this sin. I'm still struggling with this. Lord, why is this still going on and you want to be free so badly, but you haven't been free? I'm here to tell you this morning. It's because maybe there's deep places in your heart you haven't really fully surrendered to him. I've still got places. We all still have places. Because this is a journey of sanctifying grace. <laughs> Give yourself grace, but allow the Holy Spirit to come and to fill you up, allowing you to be holy as God is holy. Would you rise with me and stand to your feet? I want to invite the prayer team forward. This is what we're going to do this morning.